Welcome to Exhibition. And hello, Ewan McLeod. Hi, Richard. How are you going? I'm going well, thank you. Uh, and look, rather differently today, we're actually not talking about a specific exhibition. We're talking about a book. Um, I and hope we're talking about is... someone else's book. That would be even more fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're talking about something that is half your book. The book is called High Wire. And it's a collaboration uh, between you and New Zealand author Lloyd Jones. Lloyd Jones, who's uh, a very well known author, written a number of works, but perhaps the best known is uh, Mr. Pip, um, which was made. He doesn't by... like it when you say that. He, he gets a bit, it's a, sort of like one of those ones where it's become a bit of a millstone around his neck, I think. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> look, sometimes very successful individual works kind of do that for you, but uh, still, anyway, that's a, a way that many people might. might yes, that's the one they know. That's um, right. But a very well respected uh, New Zealand author, and you, of course a very well-respected Australian painter. How did the two of you decide to collaborate in this way? Um, not that long ago, I was in Wellington at, at his place and he was talking about the po potential of doing a kind of an artist's book. I, I, um, it's kind of even hard to know what you'd call it, but I, I think I, um, so it's not, not him writing about my paintings, which would be like a catalogue, or me illustrating his book, which would be like an illustrated book. It's very a very much a different genre. Um, and uh, yeah, I think he called it an adult's picture book, which is probably um, probably pretty pretty normal. That, that's probably a better way of describing it. But I guess so the, the, I guess most of all and most importantly, whatever it is, it is a it is a collaboration of two creative minds. How, how do uh, a painter and a writer, an, an artist and an author, actually work together to produce something that, that coalesces, that makes sense? Hmm, because that is its success and failure, isn't it? As if, if that um, sort of teases something out more, more than one or the other. You know, it, it, you know, it's like any good collaboration should be more than the sum of its parts. It should, it should, um, you should try and discover something that you wouldn't normally. Um, you, you know, you should be surprised, the, the, the collaborator should be surprised and the audience hopefully doubly surprised. So he came up with the idea of the bridge. Um, that was the original one. He loved this idea of a bridge from place to place. And he was also almost sort of thinking about that uh, Trans-Tasman Bridge which a lot of New Zealanders have um, taken. He's, he's spent quite a lot of time in Australia and he's um, got an Australian writer partner from Melbourne. So a lot of his time spent also in Australia, although not recently for obvious reasons. Um, and so he came up, he, that was the first concept he came up with, the bridge. And really that was all he needed to come up with. I mean, that just that, the, the idea of the bridge is so evocative. Um, of course, we discussed it and we talked about it and um, you kind of realise later that actually there is a hell of a lot of discussion goes on about it. But, but it's not sort of like, oh, I'd really love to see you write about this kind of book, a, a, a suspension bridge, or I'd love to see you write about a, a broken bridge or whatever. Mm. And on my way home back to Sydney in the aeroplane, I just drew... Um, a couple of notebooks full of little sketches of bridges, the idea of the bridge, mm. both bridges in my memory, um, bridges from when I was a child, um, the, that whole kind of idea of, of the bridge. Um, and sent, I sent a few of those to him, which actually have ultimately ended up in the book. But somewhere along the line, he changed it to high wire. He thought that was more specific. I think he mentions in the book why that is. But, yes. Um, well, actually, in the book, he does, as you say, make that uh, reference to the high wire, Philippe Petit, who uh, travelled between the Twin Towers uh, some decades ago now. Um, and I'm going to read a little extract from the book here where Lloyd mentions that, uh, that aspect of, um, uh, of uh, Philippe Petit. Uh, and he says... Ten years after Petit's daring feat, I visited one of the towers. I'm not great with heights, 
And I was reminded of this as I nervously approached a window on the top floor, or perhaps I should say the summit, and looked down on a small plane that promptly disappeared into low cloud. Suddenly I knew to a spine chilling degree how high up he'd been, what courage to trust himself, to trust the wire, to take that first step to see a bridge where no one else had. And that is the, that link into the high wire, the, the, the sense of, of danger and risk. Um, there does seem in the book, uh, both in his text and in your works, there is often a sense of danger, certainly what you seem to be showing us. I loved, I loved the way he wrote, he, wrote, he loved, wrote that, but a lot of that I hadn't actually read and tried not to read until a, a lot later in the process. So I didn't actually want to illustrate that. Um, you know, he, at some stage he said, yes, let's make it about the high wire. He felt limited by the bridge or he felt like, I think he says that too many people have been there before, which I kind of loved as well. Very, very kind of um, beautiful. Uh, and, but yes, I mean, it, the, the interesting thing is we both do talk about that sense of fear. And I notice on behind you is that little painting of a, of a guy standing on a, uh, um, a rock wall, which is exactly that, that sense of exhilaration, but all that, also that sense of um, nerve, nervousness, you know, yes. um, well, whether it's a, you know, that you're there and you're balanced, but, you know, one, one wrong step and you fall. And, yes. um, whether, whether you're uh, a person balancing on a high wire or whether you're someone standing uh, on, a, on a cliff ledge uh, as yeah. the man is, or, or as I think we see in some of the other works, those, those bridges which perhaps come to an abrupt end or a plank, <laughs> you know, there's, there's nowhere to go. Um, what, 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 what do you think you're trying to evoke uh, with that series of, of images? What are, you, what are you tussling with there? Well, I think he put it really beautifully. And I, I think a lot of the time, you're, you'll ask an artist, um, you know, what are you trying to say in these paintings? And I think one of the issues is you don't know what you're trying to say. That's why you're that's why you're drawing it. You're trying to you're trying to work it out in your head. And so, um, you know, people will often sort of say, "Well, haven't you worked that out yet?" And you think, "No, I haven't really. I don't know what I'm doing." But I think, um, to a certain extent, the way he kind of described it, which I thought was beautiful and very um, very relevant, was the creative process being one of, of um, risk, huge risk. I guess you fall off the wire, you don't necessarily die, but um, falling off the painting and making it, you know, uh, you know, producing a piece of disaster, it's awful. And you've got to climb back up and get it going again. And um, you're, you're, you're kind of risking, risking quite a lot. And um, that sort of creative sense of going out on your own, out on a limb, I think it's kind of a lovely way of putting it. And, but look, in a lot of ways, um, I felt there was a lot of risk involved in the painting, the putting in the drawings that I put in the, um, in the book, because I've never e even exhibited work like that. And they're, they're the kind of real thumbnails, they're the, the real beginnings of the work. And I often do those and they're quite private. You know, they're, they're not, they're not meant to be works of art they're not meant to be anything other than ideas and and it's like a diary entry if you think someone's reading it then you're going to be you get, you're going to do it in a very different way so you want those images to be private you know that you you're happy to draw a leg that looks like a piece of shit because you think well no one's gonna you know no one's gonna accuse me of not being Raphael or what you know you just you do what you need to do you just do what you have to do and and in uh, the book in the published book there are uh, many different media that you've used you as you say some of these are um, you know they're, they're very quick sketches uh, just drawn or, or, or very quickly, literally scribbled um, from time mm. to time. What media did you use to make the range of works in the book? Well, I've always loved drawing a ballpoint pen ever since I've been young. I just, you know, well, one, once ballpoint pens come in, I don't think when we were kids, probably you had a pencil. I never really liked pencils that much. I always loved ballpoint pens and still love drawing with ballpoint pens. So that's what they are. And just in little notebooks, um, a lot of the, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the the photographs had to be touched up because the backs came through. You know, I'm too, 
too sort of um, stingy to just draw on one side. I draw on both sides. Um, but, you know, again, they weren't meant to be seen. But what Lloyd was basically saying, and I think he's dead right, is that I summed it up in those drawings. That was any, anything more. If I elaborated on them, um, I don't know, what was I adding? And, and it was actually a really important lesson for me because I think as, um, as painters, often we become obsessed with the audience and what the audience wants. Probably all, all artists do that. And um, there's a lot of pressure on you to, to polish the turd, so to speak, and, you know, frame it all up and, and make it look nice. And, and, and to me, that it's not part of who I am. I, you know, I, I produce the thing in an incredibly rough way. I, you know, the, if I'm painting, I don't, I don't care about the paint looking nice. I don't, you know, I, want it, I don't want it to look like paint. I want it to look like stuff. I want it to look like other. And so this, this kind of idea of, of making everything look nice, often you lose, you lose something. You, you actually lose the, the intensity of that original work. I guess it's a bit like a cartoon. You know, cartoonists, they do whatever they need to do to get that idea across, and then it's, it's done, finished, bang. So, Maybe. so, so in terms of capturing those um, um, very very preliminary images, those, the, the immediacy, as you say, you've used uh, biro from time to time, uh, but what mm. are the other uh, media that you've used in the book? Yeah, so a lot of the other ones are the total opposite. They're etchings, which take a long time, you know, and there's quite a huge process involved. But even with the etchings, I've been using a method which is pretty immediate, which is blocking off the plate with bitumen just and wiping it back. And where I wipe back, I get a dark mark. So paint the whole plate with bitumen, and while it's wet, I wipe it, wipe it back. Um, and then that's open bit in the acid, uh, and then we aqua tint that. And it's a, it's a beautiful, very painterly way of working, and it, and it has an immediacy. But of course, you know, it takes about two or three weeks to get that immediacy, whereas a sketch on paper, you know, um, bang, it's done in a couple of seconds. Um, really fast. Mm. We both kind of wanted it almost to look like I'd drawn in the book, that the, the book is the physical drawing. Um, and, and a lot of them, I think, you know, it's beautifully produced. I think the production values in the book are just wonderful. And in terms of the collaboration, I think there was a third person in the collaboration, and that was the designer, Gary Stewart, who was just wonderful, put it together. Because of course, with a collaboration, it's what image do you put next to what bit of writing and um, that can often seem, you know, that you're trying to tease out an idea or it can seem like it's too obvious or, um, and so that, I think that was very, very difficult. And he, he did that with effortlessly. I don't think we got him to change many images at all. Mm. Um, some images Lloyd felt were too specific to the page that they did look a bit like they were illustrations and he changed them to a different place. Um, you know, Lloyd is, he's fantastic and then he knows what he wants, but he's also incredibly inspiring. And um, yeah, he, he was, he was brilliant to work with, really brilliant to work with. Just well, that, that, um, it's, it's also fascinating to hear because one of the things that you couldn't do in the book um, is, is, uh, show him as the the writer but he as the writer does refer to you uh mm. in, and, and he refers to the creative process to an extent again i'm just going to read um a little extract uh from the book and and what we'll see is the um is the work which appears on the opposite page to this bit of writing uh, but he says over that winter that McLeod and I wrote to each other, I had the strongest sense that he was drawing his way towards me, back to his homeland and birthplace. The shoulders of the figures sloped peacefully forward, at times purposeful, at other moments haggard in their deportment, and I wondered if in idle moments, slumped in his hammock at the back of his house off Parramatta Road in Sydney, he had summoned me on my own bridge building a lone and spectral figure leaning into his work and paving his own way with words. This brush stroke and that very deliberate one, the struts and wires of his imagination. 
Yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? Really beautiful. Very, very beautiful. Well, I've got to say, I mean, this is probably, um, probably shouldn't say this, but I don't have a hammock and I never <laughs> lie around anyway. I'm always working and work hard, of course, but it's a very beautiful, evocative image, isn't it? The hammock and it, you know, it, it just links so closely in with high wires. Now, you may not have, uh, you may not have a hammock, um, but I'm going to read another uh, extract <laughs> thing now. Um, and you can tell me if you do have the, uh, the thing referred to here. Um, Lloyd writes, High above the afternoon gloom of Glenmore Street, and already halfway across the viaduct, I stopped as if hit over the head by a memory of MacLeod's punching bag hanging from his studio ceiling near his canvases. The depressions in the bag caused by MacLeod's kicks and punches, a splatter of paint on the floor and on an easel, the studio filled with intentions and with sudden explosiveness. Yes, he's got, got that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yes, I have got a punching bag, and and Lloyd did a bit of boxing. I do a bit of karate, so we that we shared that. He, you know, I don't. I think he'd be a fearsome opponent, actually, Lloyd. I think he'd, you know, be. But yes, he likes a he likes a bit of biffo. <laughs> but actually, you said you said earlier that um, I wasn't able to put them into the book. I I actually did. I actually did a couple of. There is a card. There is a uh, an, an illustration of a chap holding a, a kind of a balancing pole with two figures on it, and and that was kind of my idea of of the designer Gary, kind of balancing me and Lloyd. Keep you know, um, and, and there is a sense in another one of the two figures on the on the um, facing off on the um, on the wire, a little bit like the Robin Hood story, you know, Robin Hood and um, Little John, wasn't it? And, yes. And neither yes. Of them gonna, who's going to pass who? And that's a that's a kind of a reference to me and Lloyd and a little bit of um, friendly jostling and, you know, um, backward and forward banter. So there is a little bit of that competitive spirit, which I think spurs you on. You know, it is there's a, there's a nice sense of that um, in it. And sadly, um, sadly, I missed the whole launch in New Zealand, and they had a, you know, had a really big launch in New Zealand. And it was very successful. I think it got to number six on the bestseller list or something or other in New Zealand, which is pretty, pretty amazing for, for a book that kind of is a little bit odd. I mean, to to place it, and um, Lloyd is intending for it to be a continuation of visual artists working with writers as a whole group of them. Which, and again, I'd love to see it being between, you know, New Zealand and Australian, which would continue that theme. But whether that happens or not, I'm not sure. I think they've got the next couple of, the next writer and the next artist work out. But um, it's a, you know, beautiful, beautiful book. So, yeah, I'd love, I'd love it if people get it, would, could get a copy. It's a little bit harder to get in Australia than it is in New Zealand. But um, we're, trying, we're sort of working on that. We're working on that. Well, fingers crossed. Um, but speaking of the future, let's let's wrap up with uh, just a sneak preview, if we can, of a major solo exhibition that you have coming up not far away, uh, beginning of September at King Street Gallery on William, called Figure in a Dissolving Landscape. Um, and I hope maybe you and I can have a good chat about that when the exhibition is happening and look at the works in detail. But give us a sense of the of the theme of the exhibition, uh, because I know there are some spectacular images. Yeah, well, it, I'm, well yeah, I'd be very excited to talk to you about that one, Richard, too. And it, um, but but before I mention that, um, there will also be a component in that exhibition of high wire. So we'll have a kind of a little bit of an unofficial launch at that at that show, and that the book will be available at that exhibition. Um, and plus a few of the um, etchings from it. So that'll be kind of a nice little, uh, we were hoping to get Lloyd to come over, but obviously impossible for that to happen. Uh, so this, the show figure in a dissolving landscape is, is based on the trip I did up into the Southern Alps in February this year, just before, just before COVID took over. So they're all very, very recent paintings, but it, I'm very excited because it's the first show I, I will have had at King on William, the big, big change for me after, 30, 30 odd years in, um, at Waters, 37 years, I think it was. But um, yeah, so uh, quite excited. 
very excited. So uh, you, you mentioned the, the, uh, the Southern Alps, of course, of New Zealand, uh, a very wild mountainous place. So there are, there are lots of climbing and, and mountain oriented works. There are indeed, yeah, and, and funnily enough, there are a lot of a lot of ropes, you know, with the with the high wire rope, and then the uh, the rope connecting the climber to the other climber, or the connecting them to some kind of um, terra firma. So it's interesting how things work out, actually, because um, you know there's a, there's a, such an obvious link between the two projects. And in actual fact, in the exhibition, there are a couple of high wire paintings that are they're more paintings that I've been looking at developing from the book and I want to still do that but um, you know the, the the other the other paintings have sort of taken over at the moment but I'll I'll get back onto it Richard I'll get back onto it. <laughs> well we'll look forward to that but for now you and McLeod thanks for sharing your book High Wire with us today. Thank you Richard I really appreciate you talking to me it's wonderful.